Welcome to this week's episode of the Inside Kingston podcast, where experienced professionals, entrepreneurs, and community leaders based in Kingston-upon-Thames are invited on to share their story with us. I'm your host, Amir Rochalima. This week's episode of the Inside Kingston podcast is brought to you by Holland Harn & Wells, a financial planning and wealth management firm based in Kingston-upon-Thames. Holland Harn & Wells specialises in retirement planning for senior professionals and successful business owners. Visit hhw-uk.com to start feeling more relaxed and confident about your financial future. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. I'm joined today by Louise Finn. Louise is the owner of Dental Stock Exchange, a company that puts dental professionals in contact with each other so that products can be recycled and given a new home. What's unique about Louise is how she stumbled upon her business idea whilst working as a dental sales rep, ultimately creating a solution that is good both for dental professionals and good for the environment. And be sure to listen to the end, where Louise shares with us some tips on how us as parents can set our children up for a life of healthy dental habits. So whether you're interested in knowing more about the world of dental products, or would like to know more about what it takes to run a successful independent business, then I hope you enjoy this episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. Welcome, Louise Finn, to the Inside Kingston podcast. Louise, I'm really excited about this conversation because I think the idea behind your business is really interesting. And I think there's actually an opportunity for myself and our listeners to learn from your experience on how you saw the opportunity for your business. And perhaps, you know, we can apply this to our own respective professional fields as well. So I can't wait to sort of pull those threads with you throughout this conversation. But um, to kick off this conversation, I'd like to go back in time, if that's okay. So, Louise, where did you grow up? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm just really pleased to be here. So I was born in Rygate, so in the late 60s. And uh, so I'm glad no one can see me. This is a podcast because obviously I don't look that old at all. And and then moved to Chessington um, with my parents and my twin sister when we were just a few months old. And uh, my parents still live in the same house as we grew up in. And my dad's parents lived there before them. So it's been a real, you know, so Chessington's been a real, um, you know, place for, for the whole family to be. So, um, so yeah, I've always lived in and around Chessington, different houses, but always close by um, Tolworth, Surbiton. I think I made it as far as Thames Ditton once, but that's about <laughs> as far as far as I've gone. Very cool. And what did you study after secondary school? So after secondary school, um, I started doing my A levels, and um, and then decided I just didn't want to to do that. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, basically, I went and got a job in a dental practice. Um, it was just on a real whim. Left school one afternoon, went into Kingston, got a job in a dental practice in Kingston and um, and started there as, as a nurse. And I just loved it. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. And um, so I stayed nursing for quite a few years. So in Kingston, then at my own dental practice in Chessington and then again in, in Thames Ditton. So, yeah, I did nursing for about 12 years. So it was great. It was a real community feel. Obviously, I was working and living in the same area, knew a lot of the same people, knew a lot of the patients. Um, and then from then, I moved into dental sales and marketing. And that actually led to becoming um, an educator for root canal treatments. Wow. Which, when I say that to people, I can see them like squirm at the thought of root canal. And um, so, yeah, so I was helping dentists um with new techniques with new materials so that they could basically um do root canal treatments more predictable and um and just easier really so yeah so that's 10 10 years of my life doing that that's really cool and that's a really interesting um career journey there and and you know what's interesting about that louise i came up through sort of an unorthodox field in the field of finance to then arrive at financial planning and other guests on the show have also sort of found their way through their profession to where they are at the moment and 
I think that some of the feedback I get from listeners is sometimes they don't even, they aren't even aware of this, the sort of jobs that exist out there, you know, and your career journey is an example of that. Not so much the dental nursing side, that's, that's fairly, I think more obvious, but the sort of business development side, the business to business side of uh, like a, a retail firm and, and the dentist or, or the dental practice and, you know, the, the reps and the things that go on there as, um, are, are all quite amazing. And it's, it's a vast, vast field, isn't it? Well, it was just so very strange because as a nurse in practice, root canal treatment was one of the things I hated the most. I never felt very involved. It was very time consuming. It was fiddly. I didn't really feel I was kind of utilised. And it was always the treatment that was done at two o'clock when you came after lunch. So it was boring and you just kind of wanted to fall asleep. And it was, I just hated it. And so it was just the most bizarre thing to then go on to then become an educator in root canal treatment. I would never have thought it. I thought it would be an area that I would hate. But it's Instead, I was um, I trained in Switzerland, which is where the manufacturers of these particular systems are. And I had just the most fantastic training, the most surrounded by the most amazing opinion leaders and endodontists that we've got in this country. And uh, I worked in all of the dental schools in you know England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And um, yeah, it was just I didn't let's say completely unwritten. Didn't know where that's where it's going to go, but I'm just so glad it did. It was an amazing really experience. Nice. And bringing this conversation to the present, could you tell us a little bit about your business today? Well, if I can give you a little bit of background to how it all changed. So so I've been doing this job. I've got this fantastic job. I love it. And um, But about 10 years ago, I wasn't in a good place. And I'd been struggling for a little while, well, for quite a long time, actually, before that. I had this like severe pain in my legs, which has been left um, undiagnosed for quite a long time. And so I'd left my job as I felt really embarrassed like I felt like I couldn't do my work properly I traveled quite a lot with my job and driving and walking by this point was becoming more and more difficult so it was about 10 years ago when I just couldn't walk at all and um, I ended up in St George's Hospital I was in absolute agony which I was which was happening like pretty much every day and after a few days there, I was finally diagnosed with dystonia and HSP wow. so dystonia is a neurological movement disorder and um and hsp is hereditary spastic paraplegia so here i was i was i've now got no job i've gone from you know having a job and everything well it wasn't normal i knew something wasn't right but i was in a wheelchair basically um my driving license had been taken away um and then my partner left um left me with two children aged 7 and 13 um as he couldn't cope um with me and the kids and that's not me judging him I did judge him at the time but he just couldn't cope and I hated everybody I hated the doctors for taking so long to diagnose me if I'd known what was going on I would have stayed in my job um, where I had private health and I had a good salary I hated my bosses at work but not seeing that I was struggling and that I felt that I couldn't go to them and explain what was going on and that you know I felt that I had no alternative but to leave I hated my ex at the time and I hated myself and I you know my life and there's two sayings that really resonate with me now kind of looking back over that time the first thing is I didn't realize I was a bully until I heard the way I spoke to myself and that was so true at that time I was beating myself up badly and the bad feelings I had towards others was a second lesson I would like to learn because having those feelings was how can I explain it it was like drinking poison and waiting for somebody else to die. Mm. That feeling I was allowing myself to dwell on was only ever going to poison me. Does that does that make sense? Hundred percent sense. Gosh, I can't. I can't. We all relate to just a tad bit of what you're saying there, Louise, which is this business of sometimes our own mental self talk is a, a very bad poison, and it's only affecting the container that it's within. Absolutely. And you can't always change what's happening to you, but you can choose what you do with that information and how you handle it. And that was a massive learning curve for me. So Dental Stock Exchange, which is the business I set up um, and the business I still run now, saved me, really. It gave me something to do, gave me a purpose, a new identity. Um, so the concept of recycling dental equipment had been on my mind for years. Um, I'd been around, obviously, the dental environment. I mean, I've been in dental now for 36 years. So I've seen store cupboards in dental practices full of used equipment, uh, basements loaded up, attics, sheds, 
you know, you name it. If there's a space in a dental practice, it will have stuff in it that they've bought and don't use and it's been put away. Um, and, um, and I thought, well, how great would this be if we could get this equipment back into circulation, back into the hands of others? Um, firstly, to use it and stop it ending up in landfill, being dumped. That was a big issue. Um, and also, it would give dentists that were just starting off access to equipment that financially was probably out of their reach um, if they only had the option to buy new. And I thought about it as a patient myself and as a mother of kids that were obviously having dental treatment was how could I try or have any impact on making sure that the best dentistry was available to us? So to give dentists access to equipment that um, might have been prohibitive on price, um, but could help them provide better dentistry. I mean, that just seemed like a no-brainer to me, really. And I really think that Andy, who I work with here, I think um, Andy and myself over the last 10 years have, have really helped to achieve that. Yeah, and this is, for me, the thing that really struck me when I was very kindly introduced to you by a previous guest. When I heard the brief of your company, and then I went and checked that out online, I thought, this is such a great idea. I, thought, I need to speak with Louise about this because surely it's true, and I'm going to do some introspective thinking of this, that in any of our respective professional fields, from any of the listeners that are hearing us now, there are things that we, even on a self-taught basis, know could be improved in our industry, in our sector, in our profession. We see it time and time again, be it because we have a business-to-business -business relationship or a business-to-customer relationship, but we just see it and we then go and do nothing about it. And I love yeah. that you went and you did something about it. <laughs> well, and I and I think, you know, and again, a place where I've got there, and again, this isn't wasn't something I thought to bring up today, was but but years and years before that, when I was actually a dental nurse, I was probably only about 20. Um the kind of little flosset things that we've got now, you know, the little floss on a stick, that didn't exist then. And I actually remember speaking to a patient about how difficult it was for him to floss. And we actually sat, we spent about an hour together, and um, we drew out a plan of what something would look like that would help him. And we've got some putty and we've got, and we literally sat there. It was like a, like a children's craft hour. And we sat there and we basically made what we would know today as these little floss on a stick. Um, and, um, and I just thought, wow, what an amazing thing we've just had. And we just thought it was a bit of fun. And um, and it was years later that I saw them in boots, saw them online. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I've probably still got the drawings of that somewhere. I can't believe that I'd invented something without even thinking and I hadn't done anything with it. So I think this idea with the, with the stock, um, and I knew that there was millions, and I do mean millions of pounds worth of stock just sitting in surgeries because dental and medical equipment is so expensive. And that's why people don't get rid of it. It gets why it gets stored. Um, so just to bring it back into circulation, I, I, I think I'd, so I'd written the plan or had a plan years ago, had a great job. So Saturday did nothing with it. And thank goodness I had that because to say the minute I found myself in a position I was I had a go-to place there was a plan it wasn't sculpted it wasn't per perfect but it was good enough to get started and um and I feel really um lucky that um you know that I had the chance then to fulfill something that had been in my head for all those years yeah that's that's fantastic Louise and hats off for you to that so the interesting thing is I've I've um I've interviewed other business owners on the podcast here who, in their own profession or their own field, they have what I would call a marketplace. Is it fair to char characterize your business somewhat as a marketplace where you've identified this gap of uh, effectively creating a mechanism for dental practices to recycle stock and get stock that they're not using back into circulation? But you also need to bring, and maybe at the beginning it was more so than now, you also needed to bring an element of trust to this, which, of course, your professional expertise naturally probably brought to it. But I'm guessing there was quite a bit of business development going on as well to ensure that trust collided with the, the, the marketplace that you created. I was very I was very lucky because, um, as I say, my, my entire background had been dental. And, um, and when I'd been a rep on the road, I was covering most of the well really from Norfolk to Yard White my territory at the time was huge so there was a lot of local practices I knew then when I kind of niched down into endodontics which is root canal treatment that then gave me a much bigger scope across the country that was working a lot um kind of you know with opinion leaders and a lot of influencers so 
I was very, very lucky when I started that I still had this kind of network. I could run the ideas past them. Did I think it was going to work? But but weirdly or strangely, I also ran into quite a lot of reluctance because obviously I've come from a dental sales environment and they saw me as competition. Um, why would a dentist buy something new from them if they could buy it from me secondhand by half price? So I did hit a bit of a wall at the beginning um, from colleagues, you know, ex-colleagues um, who weren't that supportive initially. And um, and I also got quite a few um, emails from a, well, a couple of, of, of dentists, actually, who had dental companies saying, this will never work. This has been tried before. You'll fail. Um, I even got accused of not being able to spell my my business name correctly because I don't have an E on the exchange. It's just an X. And it was like, uh, I just couldn't believe the comments that I got, the real negativity from some people. But I think because I was so well known in the profession and I'm not one to just, even though I couldn't physically leave the house, I was on the phone all the time. I liked to talk, as you can tell, <laughs> I was a, a communicator. I wanted to ask all these questions, find out what was going on. I think after a while, the fact that we were able to um, bring some money back to these dental practices, what it actually enabled these other reps and other companies to do was upsell on what they wanted to sell. So what was starting to happen was reps were ringing me and saying, you know, Dr. So-and-so wants to buy, you know, X. Um, We'd really love it, or he'd really love it, or she'd really love it if they could have all this included, but that's another thousand pounds. So I'd be like, okay, well, what have they got in their practice that we might be able to get a thousand pounds for that they don't use? Somebody else would benefit from using it. So it gets it put back into circulation and that gives them the money, that releases the money back to the surgery to reinvest in something else in their practice. Now, suddenly we have this huge mind shift of, okay, this isn't competition. No. This is, A, I wasn't, I wasn't an eBay. I mean, I was called for a long time DBay is what I was referred to. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't a dental eBay. I was buying and selling um, or have, allowing a platform for dentists to buy and sell secondhand, but it was only ever for dentists. It was only ever for UK dentists. And there's a real camaraderie and a real network with dentists in the UK. They like working with their own people. It's a, it's a very, very small community. There's only about 22,000 dentists in the UK. It's, it's tiny. And everybody's so webbed. Everyone's so linked. You know, that's without all the social media now. But um, you don't realise how many people know each other. It's such a small community. So I think through reputation and then when we started getting endorsements from the dental manufacturers the dental distributors as well it they suddenly saw this made sense um i was actually helping them not getting in their way and that's the way that it's continued um to today yeah that's fantastic great success story and i really appreciate you sharing that with us louise that's really really cool now Louise, can I switch gears on you slightly? And I appreciate you're not a dental practitioner as such today, but nonetheless, you have been around that world for so long that I think it will be almost, I'm, I can hear my listeners shouting at me if I don't ask you this question. In particular, for our younger listeners, like myself, who have young families, um, mm-hmm. are there any particular tips that you would have, given that you're a mum yourself, to help parents maintain and improve the dental health of their little ones? I think the most important thing, um, there's probably quite a lot of things, but the most important thing with with children is to get your children into a dental practice as early as possible. So even if they don't ever get in the chair, but they go with you, um, so not when you're having treatment done, but just when you're going for a checkup, um, because there's a lot of older people, like I can remember with my mum, I can remember going to the dentist, and actually I ended up working in this practice, so it was even more funny, but I can remember going to the dentist one day with my mum and my twin, and my mum's name got called over the tannoy, and we got up, and we walked out into the hallway, and instead of turning right and going into the dental um, surgery, we turned left and went out the front door and walked home. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because my mum was absolutely terrified of the dentist. So rather than show us her fears and her anxiety, she just made that sec- you know, split second decision. I can't do this. I've got the kids in tow. And we went home. And um, I mean, it's funny when I think about it now, but I think the, the important message with this is obviously don't take your kids, your young kids, if you're having treatment or if you're really over anxious yourself. That's the first thing. But do take them when you're having a checkup. Let them get 
used to the environment, let them get used to the sounds. Um, I mean, in my day, um, materials were a lot stronger. The scent of materials, dental surgeries smelt like dental surgeries in the same way like a swimming pool would smell like a swimming pool. You don't have that so much now. Dental surgeries are much more spa-like and much more kind of holistic and so much more relaxing. Some of them are even like hotels. I mean, some of them I see now are just like, you know, the most beautiful hotel you could wish to go and see. They don't look like a dental practice at all. And this is something that I think that you will, will see over the next few years is industry start to move towards um and um so yeah take your children as early as possible have them sit with you have them ride on the chair with you you know later on get the dentist to look in their mouth they don't have to put an instrument or anything in but just get them really used to the environment the second thing is is obviously um just being just sensible with stuff at home i think one of the the real things i used to see it doesn't happen now in surgeries but when i started all those years ago we used to do like full surgery, full um, teeth clearances, like basically extract teeth from children. It was done on a Friday where children would literally come in, be sedated, and they'd have pretty much all of their teeth taken out. Wow. And I mean, you don't see that now, thank goodness. It probably still happens in other parts of the country. It doesn't happen so much. Definitely it doesn't happen so much in this area. But that was normally where dummies had been coated in anything you can imagine, honey, um just something sweet for the child to be able to suck on um ribena put in baby bottles so it was just resting against their teeth the whole time um just things like that that um not you know patients um parents weren't doing that to um to obviously cause any damage to their children it was just they hadn't been educated not to do it Mm -hmm. so um so I think that was Something like with my children, I was just very, very conscious. And even when my friends, when my friends, uh, sorry, when my kids' friends come to stay um, from an early age and even up till now, I've always got toothbrushes here. And because they always arrive without a toothbrush. And I'm like, you know, that might be acceptable in your house. That's not acceptable in mine. If you're here and you're staying over, you brush your teeth at night, you brush your teeth in the morning. And that, and my kids just go, don't argue with her. Like you hear the end of it, just get out there and do it. And with the, we used to have fun with disclosing tablets, you know, that show up um, where plaque has been left. I mean, my bathroom used to look like a massacre afterwards because they were normally bright red. And uh, but the kids, you know, I used to have like, you know, the bathroom just full of children with these disclosing tablets and they'd be brushing away. And it was fun. So I think they were kind of the things I would be to say to parents of like young children. The other thing I think we need to be really careful of is, is our communication. And that's things like saying or not saying to kids, don't be frightened, don't be scared. Because we don't, as humans, we don't process the kind of don't word. We focus on the, the worry, the scared. And that's what you hear. So when you tell anybody, don't worry, you know, don't be frightened, there's nothing to worry, then all they suddenly, oh, should I be worried? Should I be frightened? So I see this with 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 kids when their parents come into the surgery. And I see now quite a lot of parents being asked to leave the dental surgery when their children are having treatment because parents who are being very loving and wanting to support their children by using the wrong language can actually instill a fear in the child that the child probably didn't even have. Mm-hmm. Does that make does that make sense? Those are awesome tips, Louise, and I, I appreciate you sharing them. And something that I myself will be mindful of going forward, because I'm I'm with you. I think it's important that early doors I set the right expectations so that they can they can willingly put themselves forward to this experience up until the point where they understand it's an experience that actually will help them because it will ensure you know good dental hygiene, good dental health, which of course we know brings so many benefits to life. It's you know unbelievable. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Um, it's please, related to oh, sorry, sorry please no please it's, it's related to so many other health factors as well so yeah so good oral hygiene is just really important and just seeing your dentist regularly just for checkups i mean with oral cancer and things like that now that dentists can pick up on this so early um is you know everybody should be having their checkups done regularly and obviously with with covid that stopped uh, or made a lot of people very anxious about going back to the dental practice there's so many procedures been put in place i mean dentists to be fair have always been pretty good at cross infection control we've always had you know, diseases and viruses and things that we're trying to protect everybody from, from hepatitis to HIV to, you know, all these different things that we've always had to be very mindful of. So cross-infection has always been key. So, um, and so dentists have always been very geared for this. So I think it's still, 
there'll be more damage done, I think, by people avoiding going to the surgeries, um, things that will get missed by people being reluctant to go. So I would start encouraging people if they haven't gone, if they've had, if they're worried, then to speak to their um, local surgery, get that reassurance that they need and, and go back and start back on their journey of their oral health. That makes a lot of sense to me. And Louise, you mentioned there the word uh, COVID, and I wanted to switch gears again with you, if I may. This is a question I've been asking every single guest over these last pretty much 12 months. How has COVID uh, and the COVID lockdowns uh, affected your business? Oh, right. Well, when COVID has struck, obviously, first time around, um, we lost... Um, basically four months worth of business um, pretty much overnight because dental surgeries were were closed down like everybody else. They weren't um, deemed uh, an emergency service, which in hindsight probably wasn't correct. Um, So, yeah, so obviously the dental surgeries closed their doors. All the work that we had in the pipeline just just stopped. So there was the initial, um, like, worry about what was going to happen um and then because everybody was off everybody that I was associated with was off it was like okay well this gives me a chance to to do some things so first of all it was was to enjoy being with the children um it was to enjoy the, the weather obviously we had the most fantastic weather and um so I think um yeah there was a lot of things that happened through COVID so well first of all it allowed me um gave me some time to work on myself. And that happened in various different ways. So firstly, it allowed me to revisit all my physio that I'd had um, because obviously I wasn't, I still wasn't walking. I wasn't in a wheelchair, but I was using two crutches to get around and I had an adapted car. um, So I can't drive with my feet at all. So I revisited all my physio instructions that I'd had and that I'd done, but probably hadn't done them to the best of my ability. So, um, and I did gentle exercise over those first four months. And at the end of those four months, I walked. I didn't walk very far, but I walked unaided, so without crutches, without falling over. And that really made me think, like, how much more could I achieve? And just by allowing myself that time to invest in myself um and that was a really powerful moment really um so and I'm just so proud that I managed to achieve that that's amazing I also enrolled yeah thank you um I also enrolled on some kind of self-development courses and I attended a lot of like Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi courses and business courses. Um, So I say, I mean, we were closed, as as I said, for four months and they predicted that one in five surgeries would stay closed. Um, That wasn't the case, luckily, but I really didn't know at that time if dental stock exchange would survive. So I wanted new skills in case I had to diversify. Um, so I did some dental training um, to learn some more communication skills, how to build rapport with patients. But what I got from that course was more than I could have ever imagined. What I actually learned um, were skills that I use and I continue to use with my daughter, who um, had closed off from me at the time and from the world. She was struggling with anxiety, as so many young people are and that's not been helped um, and it's definitely been compounded by the restraints of of COVID and I learned a lot of lessons I learned to actively listen to her not hear her but to listen to her like close my laptop put my pen down close my book um, so she had my undivided attention Um, I learned to repeat words back to her like the same words that she said to me not my interpretation of them and let's face it teenagers speak a completely different language to what I speak so she knew I was listening because it wasn't vocabulary that I would normally use and then I practiced um, rapport building skills which I'd learned on this course and I just couldn't believe that this worked with my daughter it was just easy repeatable teachable skills that enabled her to relax and talk to me and the first time we did it I can remember being sat at the kitchen table and I thought right I'm just gonna practice this kind of on her and just kind of see what happens and we talked for over two and a half hours wow it was such a massive 
breakthrough so much so that I actually struggled to break the rapport because I had dinner to cook and I was like okay this is going really well but we need to wrap this up now and we were in such a state of rapport that she just wanted to keep talking so it was just the strangest things and just the use of different words um I'm probably going into probably a little bit too much detail so um so sorry if I am but it was just so powerful so Things that I'd I'd learned about in the past and I've never really used them, but things like not using the word but in a sentence, but replacing it with and. So, for example, things like I'd say, um, like, I love you, but can you go and tidy the kitchen? Okay, so that was like a backhanded compliment, if you like, if you want to look at it in that way. It was quite a negative feel to it. So then I've learned, okay, replace the word but with and. So then I'd say something like, I love you. And when you get a moment, can you go and clean the kitchen up? Now, the, the and and not the but, she'd be like, oh, OK, mum. Like, you know, completely different message. It transformed the message. Now, you know, I'm not trying to change the world, but if there's anybody listening to this that resonates with just that one person that feels like I'm talking to them. And then just by learning just these couple of really easy techniques that would help them get a better, more open, maybe a longer conversation with their child, then, you know, why wouldn't I share this? So thank you for letting me let me say that. Louise, what are some of the key business lessons that you've learned throughout your life? Oh, wow. I think the biggest uh, message I would probably say is good is good enough um would be my first thing I think when I first started um I procrastinated I took a long time to get everything ready I say I'd had a picture in my head for a long time but I hadn't really worked out any of the logistics I didn't have any of the skills I was I had no resources so I had to be resourceful you know you you had to find things that were free you I had to learn I had to find things you know read things in books find things online so but I was always trying to get things perfect before I was ready to kind of put it out in the world so I think one of the biggest business lessons I've learned is good is good enough and if it gets out there you can always go back and improve on it but a kind of um, unpolished message that reaches thousands is better than a perfect message that reaches nobody because you don't ever get a perfect message. I love that. When you look back at your career journey to date, what are you most proud of? Well, I've got two things that I'm really, really proud of in my personal life and two things that I'm really proud of in my business life. So are you okay if I go through? Absolutely, the please. So yeah, so I've got four moments in my life that I'm particularly proud of. So two in my personal and two in my business. Um, So obviously not including the birth of my kids, which would obviously trump everything. Um, So my first thing I'm really proud of was when I was eight years old, maybe about eight, nine years old, I won a poster design competition at school. And my poster was around the dangers of smoking. And not only did I win the competition, which was lovely, And I was in the local paper and that was great. But the biggest, biggest um, takeaway from that, to my delight, was my dad stopped smoking. Oh, wow. As a result. Yeah, I was like, this is this is amazing. So, yeah, so I was really, really proud of that. I didn't expect that to happen. Um, But it was obviously something that was really important to me. And um, because I remember I was only little and I remember the sharing it with him and showing him the design and realising that although my mum would be the one I would normally go to, I wanted him really involved with what I was doing. And I think subconsciously it was to try and get this message across that, you know, the damages of what he was doing to himself so so that was definitely one um a proud moment for me personally my first business one was obviously setting up the business of my own business during what was a very difficult time with no experience and and no resources but as I say wow that makes you so resourceful uh and the fact that it's still running today you know 10 years later um, I'm really proud um my second um proudest moment in business was um it was about 2017 I was working with a charity called AOG which was run by a dear friend of mine a dentist um Dr Manny Fassant um he set up a seven and a half acre complex um which included accommodation for orphans and the disabled which was something that was very dear to my heart schools adult training workshops medical and dental clinics so again something very dear to my heart 
And I was truly honoured that my name and my business name both appeared on a plaque that was hung on the wall at the Lake Victoria Disability Centre in Musoma as we had helped with the build of the dental facilities in Africa. Um, And I really hope to be able to go there um, one day myself. And um, and and I say and, and last year, as I've already kind of said earlier, the um, what I'm really proud of myself is giving myself that time, like I say, to be able to go back and learn to relearn or to start to relearn to walk again. Yeah, that's super. Mm-hmm. That's really cool to hear and so inspiring as well, Louise. What next for you and your business? Are there any projects in the pipeline that you can tell us about? Um, there are. My, the dental business, I think, will continue as it is for a while. I've um, I've joined Clubhouse. Um, I don't know whether you're on it yourself, the new kind of social media app. The, um, I love it. Um, that has definitely given me new ways to communicate to people. So I definitely do use that as a, as a marketing tool. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not somewhere that you go to kind of sell anything but it's somewhere that you go to build relationships which is really what I'm kind of all about really and that kind of credibility and that trust so um but I think the actual business as it works itself will kind of stay as it is it's, it's a it's a model that works we tweak it every now and again um but you know it is what it is if I'm honest and um and, and it works well so I think we'll continue and I think also as well what happened through COVID rather than um the surgery is closing down and us thinking, you know, what are we going to come back to? What happened in actual fact was when we did come back, surgeries wanted more um, dental chairs, more equipment put into any spare room that they had. Because how dental surgeries have to work now, if they do any procedures where there's aerosols, they have to have a downtime, what they call a fallow time, uh, between patients to allow everything to settle so they can clean it up. So um, appointments in surgeries became more and more spaced out so to allow for this um, we were being contacted more by dentists who wanted to put in another dental chair another lot of cabinetry set up another surgery so they could go from one leave that to settle and be disinfected and go to another one and work in there so it stopped them having this downtime hmm. so we just got crazy crazy busy and uh, and this is still happening uh, more and more i've got better at, at social media so um so again we've got more um, kind of customers coming in in that way but if I'm honest most of it has been through word of mouth so um so we'll definitely carry on doing that but I'm at a place now where um my passion I suppose is moving more outside of kind of the dental arena so not moving away from that job but I want to know what story is inside of other people as I believe we've all got a story and what happened in my life has shaped who I am and um and you know I've made mistakes and um and I think you can learn from anything that you do and come out the other side so for me it was you know going back years and years so I had my own mental health struggles um you know quite a few years ago now um there wasn't an awful lot of support around um, and um and you know, there was a real lack I think of resources in this in this town mm-hmm. my daughter um has got issues um and, and as I say I don't really feel that there are great mm-hmm. mental health um resources in this in this region I went through a horrendous divorce um I've started a business from scratch I've learned to walk again so um I think in this time in life, we don't have to, we don't have the time necessarily to learn by our own mistakes. And why should we when we can learn from other people who have made mistakes before us? So I might only be a page or a book in front of somebody else who's on the same path. But if I can help them not make the same mistakes, um, then I think it would be wrong of me not to share that. So, for example, so I'm struggling myself with my daughter being vegetarian at the moment. So um I think I thought it was a a phase but this looks like it's going to be a permanent thing so I've got to make this shift I don't know what to give her what to cook for her to make sure she gets everything that she needs in her diet so if I can find somebody that can tell me because they've been on that journey with with a kid and um then rather me figure it all out on my own I want somebody to share that knowledge with me because they've been there they've done it they've come out the other side they know what works and that will get me there a lot quicker 
So I think we're in a really interesting time in our lives. I think there's going to be, well, there's already a massive shift to this kind of knowledge, knowledge based um, type of business. And I think if you interview or speak to a lot of kind of um, guys at, um, guys and girls at college, I think this is going to be something that this is what they're kind of, you know, the industry that they're inspiring to go into when they um, qualify. So I think the industry is predicted to be worth over 300 million pounds in like by 2026. So I want to connect with local people and find out what their story is. What would they um, what would they do? What would they go back and say to themselves 10 years ago, 20 years ago, knowing what they know now about a certain situation that they've been through? And what would that conversation be um, that would stop them having to go through that situation, that experience again? How much benefit would that be to other people? So, yeah, so it's like friends and neighbours on here, like anybody that wants to contact me with their stories, what they've learned and that will empower others in our community, or at the very um, least realise that people are not alone and that there is hope on the other side, I'd be really interested to engage with other people in the local area. Yeah, and, and we're kindred spirits, Louise, because a lot of what you said there is not only the premise, but the the raison d'etre of the Inside Kingston podcast. You know, I, I, I'm with you 100%. There is so much we can learn from each other. And, you know, look, we can't always conquer England or conquer the whole of Britain with an idea. But if each of us try to at least instigate change or instigate a sense of community in our own local area, in our own street, and just start building it from that, one little ripple multiplied by a whole bunch of other people making a little ripple in their side of the world makes a massive difference. So uh, yeah, I, I wish you every success with that idea. It sounds super exciting. Thank you. Yeah, As I'm we, really excited about it. Excellent. As we start to wrap up, I'd like to ask you a few quick fire questions that our listeners are always interested in. So Louise, <laughs> what do you do to relax outside of the office? I don't relax outside of the office. Um, I am forever learning. Um, do I, I don't know whether it's a COVID thing. I don't know. But I just feel so uh, motivated to do something. And I don't know whether that was sitting around for a while and not doing anything. And I just like thought, oh, God, this is crazy. You know, and what I'm, I should I felt like I should be doing something. And it's and it's OK to give yourself time off. It's OK to give yourself a break. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm not I'm not condoning that. But I always just want to learn. And, and now, so what I've done now, I've kind of started to adopt. And, you know, I'm 52. It's taken me a bit of a while to get there. But I've started to adopt a new kind of approach to my life. So it's things like getting up when my alarm first rings, you know, just my alarm goes off, get out of bed, get out of bed and start moving. I'm 52. I need my metabolism to kick in as soon as possible. Believe me. So I just get up, I go for a walk. I say, I can't walk very far, but I can get, I'm very blessed to be near Horton Country Park. So I can use that. And um, I don't have to go very far. It's beautiful. And I do that very early in the morning. I come back, obviously, then I'm working. And then I'm all about trying to be the best version of me I can be the best friend the best mum the best um colleague the best boss so at the moment I'm studying studying like crazy um I say a lot of Tony Robbins courses a lot of books so I read a lot so I'm on a mission to try and read um well I was trying to do a book a week but I'm probably down to about a book a month if I'm completely honest because uh um I don't have a very long attention span so I tend to have to go back and reread things before it really kind of you know resonates um so yeah so I am reading a lot more than I was and um and again you know just learning from other people's experiences trying to learn things quicker well on the subject of books are there any that you've recently read that you'd recommend to our listeners um I read um, before I kind of went on this self-development um, kind of crazy um, <laughs> journey. I'd read very recently Michelle Moan. So she did like old snow. So I like reading about people's um, personal kind of journeys. And, um, and you know, a lot of them are real kind of rag to riches successes. And you, you can't help but wonder, you know, a lot of these people, were um they really had either themselves had kind of burnt their bridges and had no alternative but to make a real shift in their life or their bridges had been burnt sorry or their boats had been burnt um for them so you know there's that expression in it burn your boats you can't go you can't go back and um so I read quite a lot of 
books from people that have you know started with with nothing and then built something because that that real kind of passion and drive or they've seen their parents you know working so hard I mean I'm it's really funny because I've really struggled. One of my massive mindsets, which has been a real kind of limiting belief to me, is that I needed to work and I need to work all the hours God sends to have a pretty mediocre life. Because I've been brought up with parents who worked hard, who had a mediocre life. And every time I tried to do something, and this is not, I love my parents dearly, this is not you know um saying anything horrible about my parents so I, I love them I love them dearly but they would always say to me why can you not just be happy with what you've got why are you always looking for something else why 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 and but my why is because there is so much more to learn there is so much more to life if we're not moving forward and we're standing still how are we living that's not progress so I don't want to stand still. I want to learn. I want to progress. That to me is what we're here for. That's life. And if I can help people along the way, then that's even more empowering. And if I can help people along the way, help other people, then that's even more empowering. And so, yeah, I think that um, I just... Um, I've got say I've got business books here. Start with why Simon Sinek. I'm reading that at the moment. I've got the, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, the very famous Stephen Covey book. I mean, they've I actually struggle with that one. I didn't realise there's actually a children's version of that one. I've actually just ordered it for my daughter, but I actually think I'm going to read it first because I might find it easier yeah. to digest. And then I've got lots of Tony Robbins books, so lots of inspirational speakers. Um, so I'm reading. It is fun. And the stories could be very funny. They could be very emotional. But I'm not reading stories. I'm reading real life, impactful journeys um, and trying to pick up some kind of hints and tips along the way. Yeah, I love it. And are there any movies or TV shows that you've recently watched that you'd recommend to others? <laughs> oh, I got absolutely um quiz. Oh, what happened? I was on Clubhouse and it came up. Everybody started talking about The Crown. Um, so this was quite this is probably a few months ago now now I don't watch tv I'd given up watching the news um I'm one of these people who truly believes that whatever you're thinking or however you're feeling at the time you'll find evidence to support it and the news was so negative that I just decided that I just didn't want to listen to it so I'd already kind of switched off from that and um so and I said everybody was talking about the crown on on clubhouse and I was like oh never never seen any of it and oh my god you would have thought this was like the worst sin in the world that I hadn't watched it so I did sit down and watch all of that I've I binged watched it so that I could go back and go okay I've done it and the other one I'm struggling to think of the name of it was the chess player the queen's gambit queen's gambit yes loved it absolutely loved it yeah I think Um, both of those shows are great not only because the the storytelling is phenomenal whether it's close to the truth or not it doesn't matter the storytelling is amazing but I I I always say with those series the filmography is beautiful it's it's a joy to watch the filmography that they've put together yeah yeah I really enjoy both of them and say and I'm not somebody that sits and watches or can get into something I'm my daughter will very much have have me watching Big Bang Theory or Brooklyn 911 or or she's got some other things we're watching at the moment which are hysterically funny and uh, the modern family or something I think is something she's into at the moment and so for kind of 20 minutes just that light relief go in have a bit of a giggle come out and you can kind of pick it up and leave it um then that's got a lot of power as well and you know thank god for netflix and um and uh, but yeah but to have some like you say that are um stories however accurate they are but um yeah the portrayal of them and the emotion that comes across in them i think is is really important and i've really enjoyed those so yeah again anyone's got any tips out there then um let me know what's uh, what's a good series to get myself immersed into that'd be Very great cool. and finally where can people go to find out more about you and your business um so the easiest way um i do have a website which is dentalstockexchange.co.uk. So that's exchange without any. So dentalstockexchange.co.uk. Um, it doesn't give a full picture about what we do because we're actually in, in the transition to setting it up as an app. So, um, and a lot of what we do, we don't actually now do through the website. It's now just done matching people with products and people that want products um, 
and we go out and find the product. So it's a bit more of a kind of matchmaking service now rather than just a, a kind of e-commerce site. But, they can, but um, all our contact details, all my contact details are on there. So obviously, you know, my um, email address is on there, telephone number. So yeah, anything about the business or just anything about, you know, people's life stories that they want to share, go to dentalstockexchange.co.uk and you'll get all my details. Yeah, and for the benefit of our listeners, I'll make sure that I add those links to the show notes. Louise, oh, thank you. Louise, thank you for joining us here on the Inside Kingston podcast. It's been a pleasure getting to know your story. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for letting me share my story. It's been really great. Thank you so much. Have a great day. That wraps up another episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. Make sure to check out our guests' website, pay them a visit, and help spread the word about what they're doing. If you have any questions or know someone who should be a guest on the show, please feel free to get in touch. I would also love it if you could go to iTunes and leave us a review and a five-star rating. We work hard to bring on some great guests, and getting a review from you is one way to help the podcast rate well on iTunes so that others can find and enjoy the show too. Thanks for listening.